Thanks, thanks everyone for uh, joining. Uh, my name is Kevin Kim. I'm a data scientist with NASA Machine Intelligence Lab. And I guess I'll start. So today I'm here to talk about AI beyond pattern recognition, uh, particular decision-making systems. So agenda for today, I'll first talk about, or I'll first introduce you to why we need, or why I think we need AI decision-making systems. And I'll introduce you to some new perspectives around what I call uh, design theory of AI decision makers. And then I'll explore some use cases. And finally, I'll conclude with how this design theory goes beyond finance and how it generalizes to not just AI decision making systems, but perhaps even all decision making systems. All right, so quick with introduction. So if you think about how AI, artificial intelligence systems are typically are currently being used, um, two main use cases, right? So one is either you're doing prediction or you're doing pattern recognition. But how about decision-making? Yeah, can, can we truly say that there are any true decision-making AI systems? Or, or are we simply using artificial intelligence technologies to help us make decisions? So, so sort of a subtle difference there. So I think ultimately we, ultimately we want to make or we want to build AI systems that can actually help us make good decisions, right? And I think in order for us to design and build such systems, we have to understand how the decision-making process works in general. So if you think about it, there's some sort of intermediary that's going to make certain observations and determine what those observations are and how that intermediary perceived that those observations, actions will differ. And with AI, I think nowadays it's just kind of done in two different ways. One is you make the, have AI models or machine learning models make certain observations, you know, output predictions and pattern recognitions, whatever that might look like. And then you feed it off to a groups of individuals or an individual who will use the best of their critical thinking abilities to make decisions. Or you can replace them with simple rules. But there's like an issue with these two approaches. Uh, one is that it's it becomes a little hazy and difficult to quantify the risks exactly. And two, it, it, you're kind of defeating the purpose of an artificial intelligence system in the first place because if you're relying, you're, you're relying on humans and uh, simple rules to make the actual decisions then you're just making decisions that are good enough instead of making optimal or near optimal decisions, which really is the purpose of an AI in the first place. So does that mean that we want to somehow replace all human beings? Uh, again, that's kind of a scary thing when people think about AI systems, it's like, oh, this is gonna automate everything, we're gonna all lose our jobs, we're gonna all be replaced by machines. Uh, fortunately, I think this is a A mistaken notion, um, because what we really want to do is figure out some sort of an optimal design when it comes to building out AI decision makers. View everything as a design optimization problem where you somehow maximize some sort of efficiency or some degree of success. And what this means is that human beings could actually be a component within these uh, larger systems because oftentimes human will be complementary. Uh, to these computers and not necessarily supplementary. So there are some key benefits when it comes to viewing AI design as design optimization problems. Uh, one is that it becomes very easy to set up industry standards for building uh, robust, uh, building and designing robust AI systems because it helps us achieve you know, scalability and you can, we can now help define very clear divisions of labor. So instead of data scientists doing everything. Maybe you have data scientists building and training models and building out structures around it. And then you will have AI designers who will use those models to actually design good AI, uh, AI systems. Uh, second benefit is that now we can take advantage of pre-existing quantitative methods. Again, design optimization is something that's been studied since the 1950s as, as long as I can remember. So that's, that's quite a bit of time, uh, 70 years of time to really study and develop interesting methodologies. And what this means is that we're gonna be able to estimate costs much, much easier. 
and figure out what resources are required uh, pretty quickly. And last but not the least, uh, the benefit, another benefit is that we're going to be able to meet a variety of organizational needs and constraints. And this is because design optimization is a well-studied and quantified field. We're going to be able to quantify a lot of these organizational, what looks like to be hazy and somewhat abstract organizational needs and constraints and convert them into very quantifiable, very uh, structured and systematic ways of looking at things. And this is going to help us really op optimize our costs when we're trying to build AI systems and manage them. So I'll have to introduce you to this so-called design theory, uh, kind of a bold statement, but I think kind of captures the essence of what I'm trying to deliver. So if you think about decision-making systems, it really has two main components. Uh, one is what I call the model of perception, which is your understanding of the world, really. And then there's what I call the model of action, which will you know, make certain actions, make certain decisions based off on what that understanding of the world is. And now each of these individual models could be an individual, so each of these models could be an individual model or an ensemble of different models. And we're going to call each of these sub-models within an ensemble uh, decision-making components. And if you layer enough of them, this is kind of what you get. So in the big green box, you have your decision-making system, which is going to observe the current state of the world, make certain actions, and the world will react to it and provide you with some feedback. And, of course, there should be some sort of a monitoring mechanism that's going to catch on to these feedback and try to readjust your models of perception and action. Now, if this looks very, very similar to this diagram, uh, you're not wrong. Essentially, this is what reinforcement learning is. <laughs> and you can, from, from this view, uh, you can kind of think of reinforcement learning agents as being this specific type of AI decision maker that combines smaller perception and action into this one gigantic model. This is going to be very, very useful in a lot of cases, but oftentimes, uh, we're going to have constraints to using, uh, to simply using reinforcement learning techniques because maybe we want to separate, or we have to separate the model perception and action and build them out separately and trying to figure out how they're going to interact with one another uh, because maybe that's more explainable, uh, maybe there's no other way to do it. And I think another issue with reinforcement learning is that the setting, uh, you need to have constant feedback. What if the feedback loop is not very frequent enough for you to have a reinforcement learning agent? So now that I've kind of discussed what builds a uh, decision-making system, now we can think about the traits of these decision-making systems. So again, each sub-model is, gonna, is, I'm going to call them a component, and they can have a variety of different traits. And now this list that I have here is not necessarily a holistic list, but I think it's a very good start. <clears throat> so let's start with rationality, uh, which kind of has two subcomponents. So rational capacity, what, this is what I call, first thing is what I call rational capacity, and it just means on average or at best, how rational can I be? And consistency is just you know, how often can I reach my capacity? So you can think of capacity as being your out of sample error or your expected out of sample error and your consistency as being the standard deviation on that out of sample error. And bias, I, I think everybody's aware of what bias is. This is something that could be also be easily quantifiable. And then there's awareness, uh, which really has to do with how aware am I of different actions that I can take and how aware am I of different places that my data could come from. So again, as I previously mentioned, uh, each of these components could be a human being or a machine as well. So in the case of human beings, uh, the specific types of metrics that we want to capture may, may be slightly different. And of course, uh, we want to make sure that we use very high, whatever new traits we discover, I think we want to make sure that they are highly quantifiable and really can boil them, we can boil them down into very specific metrics. So, now that everything, or assuming that everything is really highly quantifiable and we can capture them pretty easily, uh, we can view this as design optimization, right? So our objectives are going to be in terms, objectives and the constraints are now going to be in terms of these traits that I've just discussed. 
So for example, maybe somehow we want to maximize rationality of our AI decision-making system, or maybe we want to minimize the bias of it. And when it comes to constraints, it's the same deal, except there's a little bit of nuance to it, because when we typically think about constraints, we think it in terms of resources that we have. How much time do we have? How much money do we have? And in our case, you know, how much computing power are we limited to? So some work needs to be done to, from translating these resource constraints into constraints in uh, defined in terms of our uh, decision-making traits, component traits. So luckily, in most cases, this is going to be a fairly straightforward task. So now let's dig into some use cases. So a particular project that I worked on at NASDAQ has to deal with, um, well, I built this framework that allows you to create smart beta portfolios or indices in a highly scalable manner. Uh, so there's four different components to it. One is a data pipeline, which feeds the data to our, pred our predictive model. In our case, this is what I, the model of perception, as I, as I previously mentioned. And then there's a security selection and portfolio optimization part, which are the models of actions, because these are the two components that are actually making the decisions. And the nice thing about this framework is that it's very, very flexible. And by that, I mean you can just replace these modules and create really any types of indices that you want. So whatever, so two examples, uh, one index that I tried to create was a high growth consumer index, which I created by, okay, I'm gonna feed in my consumer spending data and then I'm gonna use that to predict what the future P ratios are going to be. And then I'm gonna take differential between the current P ratio and the predict, uh, predicted future P ratios and then I'm going to pick my, uh, select my stocks based off on that and then run portfolio optimization on top of it. Uh, second example, I built an index uh, portfolio that is constrained by companies that are, have strong fundamentals, yet we want to look at their momentums. So how does this relate to design optimization? So a couple things that I noticed was that my models, of course, uh, in the financial sector, I think your models, because there's a lot of noise and stochastics that's involved, your models aren't going to be always going to be great. <laughs> so one thing I realized right off, right away was that my models have very, very high variance. So from there, in pretty obvious, oh, I, okay, I want to use some kind of ensemble strategy to reduce this variance, but how many do I want to have, really? And then they came in for the part of security selection because of the limitations of my model. You know, there are a couple of candidates that I had for how to go about you know, choosing uh, secure, doing security selection. But it, I couldn't tell, okay, which one is going to be better. So I had to try them out all. And then also the same issue with portfolio optimization. There are different types of techniques to when you're trying to do portfolio optimization. Maybe you want to do you know, mean variance, maybe you want to do something else, and so forth. So there's a lot of, lot of options. So this boiled down very well into a design optimization problem because now I'm looking at what type, how many models do I want to have, what type of security selection model component I want to have, what type of portfolio optimization I want to have. And you have this gigantic search space that you have to somehow search, and it's absolutely impossible to search through all of them. So you have to kind of run a design optimization problem. And the objective that I had was to, uh, <clears throat> a portfolio, uh, type, a specific type of portfolio a performance me measure that I had had in mind, and I put in the constraints around turnover, amount of compute time that I had, and I ran this gigantic optimization, and I got in, uh, hmm. and I was able to generate a sort of a well performing indices. And I'll have to, of course, show you what those results look like. So for both indices, uh, they uh, slightly outperformed the benchmark, which is always good. So as long as you see the graphs going to the, to the upper right, I think that's usually good. But you might be thinking, okay, this guy is full of something and promising the stars and the moons. So to, to, to give you a more, more clarifying picture on this, uh, sharp ratios are around, you know, high, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 for both of them, which is not the most phenomenal because, again, this, these are kind of smart beta portfolios. 
uh, but you, as you can see, the risk profiles are fairly, fairly reasonable. So we're, this is kind of the deal where you say, okay, we're not going to, obviously we're not going to you know, give you 30, 40% return every single year, but maybe a respectable 10 to 20% uh, return per annum. So let me try to walk through how this design theory goes beyond finance, right? So I've discussed portfolio optimization. And nice thing about this is that it really is a specific type of predictive resource and allocation slash control problem. And they're very similar problems outside of finance as well. So one example could be managing smart energy grids. Another one could be how do you go about uh, determining how, you, how to spend you know, your tax budgets. And for poker fans out there like myself, even poker is if you think about, you know, how much am I betting? When am I betting? Should I fold and whatnot? What or what other actions can I take to understand a little more about your opponent's <clears throat> information? So essentially, again, poker could be seen as another type of these problems as well. And so going beyond, so this kind of design theory, I think, so this is this is me kind of geeking out, could, could really expand into not just AI decision-making systems, but all sorts of decision-making systems, that including you know, governments, corporations, and even societies, I think could be designed using this kind of uh, method of thought. Uh, so this is a very, very bold claim. I, I understand that. So I, I like to clarify, I'm not the one making this claim. This is actually a very well eloquently put in one of my favorite books, uh, Science of the Artificial by Herbert Simon. So if you know who Herbert Simon is, perhaps, I mean, true, true intellectual giant, uh, only person to win a Nobel Prize in economics and, and, and a Turing Award. So one of my heroes uh, who inspired this I guess line of line of thinking. So I have to show you an example, of course, and one of these could be, I think, corporations. So if you think about how corporations behave, it's really about okay, you have a specific hierarchy in each organization, and this hierarchy is going to collect information on okay, your how you how you're going to interact with your clients, your customers, competitors, and maybe other business partners. And this information is going to travel up the hierarchy. And then your model of action will kick in and your board and the executives will decide on the general direction of the company. You know, send it down to the management, all the way to the employees will then make the day-to-day -day decisions. So let me try to end this quickly. I think I'm a little over time. Uh, so to summarize this, uh, so you can think of decision-making systems as being a combination between the model perception and model of action, and each decision-making system are going to have different components who will have certain traits, quantifiable traits, and because these traits are quantifiable, now we can view designing AI systems as a design optimization problem. And of course, this is very useful in finance as well as in use cases outside of finance. So what are next steps? Uh, so I made some bold claims around how this is a design theory, but I haven't really provided any mathematical formalizations. So that's an obvious, I think, next step. And it really means in detail are going to mean three things. So one, we want to identify more of these traits and figure out what metrics are appropriate to capture these. And two, we want to define what we mean by optimality, because I think we, if we do this in the wrong way, I think there are going to be a lot of negative consequences in the future. And third, this is a sort of an ambitious goal, is that we want to be able to research better ways how these models can interact. And the motivation behind this is that if you have a well-performing model, you can have the best models in the world, but if, they, if they're interacting in the wrong way, then maybe you're not going to have good decisions. But if you, even if you have mediocre models, and if the way you design how they interact is very well done, then you're going to end up with very good decisions. That concludes my uh, my talk, and I guess we can go into questions. And thank you.